Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, first, quick uh, pre-apology. Uh, I'm a little hoarse today, so hopefully I'm still coming out clear enough to understand, but if I, my voice goes a little wonky at any point, I apologize. Um, as it was mentioned, my name's Brett. i um, been a core developer on Python for over 15 years now. Uh, I'm dev lead on the Python extension for VS Code. Um, and that's enough about me. So just a quick show of hands. Who knows who Guido Van Rossum is? OK, I'm going to assume almost everyone. In case you don't know, Guido created Python. Uh, he's known as our benevolent dictator for life. Um, who here knows why I'm talking about replacing him for some reason? All right, most hands. If you don't, you're in for a bit of a shock later. Uh, but I'm not going to try to spoil it for you in case you don't know. Uh, but to start, let's talk about how the world worked uh, in terms of Guido's role on the Python development team up until uh, up until July 12th, 2018, let's say, for some reason. <laughs> um, so one of the really key things Guido did was he provided a vision for the language. Now, he typically didn't write this down anywhere. It was more what was just in Guido's head. But it could, I think, fairly reasonably be said that anything could be considered Pythonic if Guido said it was. And so basically what that meant was he probably innately or instinctively had an idea of where he wanted the language to be and go uh, just without writing it down. So that's what I mean here by vision. Now, how did Guido communicate that? So he did this through a couple ways. Uh, one was actually shutting down ideas that would never work. Uh, Guido would do this on Python ideas regularly where a thread would come up, someone would present an idea, and he would go, yeah, sorry, that's never going to happen. And just try to say, like, and then, they, honestly, he would mute the thread and ignore it completely for the rest of time. Uh, and then people would probably keep discussing it, even though it's never going to happen. Um, in terms of PEPs, if you're not familiar, a PEP is a Python enhancement proposal. Uh, it's like a, a RFC. It's basically a document where you outline a proposal of how you want to change the language itself. Um, Guido participated in this in terms of providing feedback. So if someone came forward with a PEP, he would often give back feedback saying, hey, I would tweak this, I'd do that, et cetera, et cetera, to try to help move it forward, or once again say no. Um, another way is Guido would choose a what was known as the BDFL delegate. So oftentimes, if something was very domain specific and Guido didn't feel comfortable making a decision, he would delegate to someone to make the final decision on the PEP, whether it was accepted or rejected. So for instance, if it was on async, uh, he might very well delegate to Yuri, for instance. And then uh, on things where there was no one really to necessarily delegate to, or Guido was typically viewed as the um, domain expert, usually on language design, he would pr pronounce on the PEP himself. And then lastly, occasionally Guido would actually come up with his own ideas, write his own PEPs, et cetera. Now, one thing to mention is you'll notice there is not much day-to-day -day stuff, and that's on purpose. Guido has made sure that the project runs itself, more or less, through the core developers on a day-to-day -day basis. So Guido's role is very much more of a higher level vision kind of thing. Uh, he did occasionally help settle disputes, nothing crazy, but it was always nice to have this higher power that anyone could appeal to and say like, hey, it should be this way, no, it should be that way, back and forth, and then Guido would just say, it's that way, and everyone would go, oh, okay, nice and done. Now, um, July 12th, 2018, um, Guido sends an email to the Python committer's mailing list. And it opens with, uh, quote, now that PEP 572 is done, which by the way, there's a talk on at 215 in this room, uh, I don't ever want to have to fight so hard for a PEP and find that so many people despise my decisions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you didn't follow PEP 572, it was a very contentious PEP. Uh, to the point that I saw some people online state that, for instance, if they ever saw any code using that PEP, they would actually refuse to review it. Uh, it got very negative uh, and very, unfor unfortunately, not really uh, friendly. Uh, and actually, I have a whole talk on this. I gave up uh, at PyCon Canada last year and a couple conferences subsequently, such as PyCon US, uh, about how we kind of all need to work on this as a community. Anyway, uh, so this is not a great way you want to read an email coming from your BDFL because uh, the very next line, sentence was, I'm basically giving myself a permanent vacation from being BDFL, and you will all be on your own. So basically, Guido retired um, as BDFL. Now, 
he did not quit entirely. He's still a core developer, but he basically said, the stress I went through trying to deal with PEP 572 was enough that he's done with being in charge. Um, and he was not going to appoint a successor. Uh, my wife, who was a bachelor's in commerce, immediately freaked out, going like, well, don't, do you have a succession plan? And we all went, uh, no. Hence why Guido asked, what are we going to do? Uh, create a democracy, anarchy, a dictatorship, a federation. Basically, um, Guido left it up to us uh, completely. Uh, and the rest of this talk is going to be talking about where we currently stand on this. Now, this is entirely in flux still. Uh, so this is accurate as of Thursday. So if something happened yesterday or today, uh, these slides might be out of date. So I apologize for that. Um, but basically what's ended up happening is we have stepped down. We have tried to self-organize as best we can to try to figure out how we are going to govern ourselves going forward. And on top of that also, basically, how we're going to choose what that governance model is going to be. So um, first of all, there's a PEP 8,000. And all these are going to be numbered 8,000 and higher. This PEP's not really that critical. Basically, it just says, numerically, all governance PEPs are going to be numbered 8,000 and higher. The ones actually proposing a governance model will be 8,010 and above. And that's basically it. Uh, PEP 8002 was a survey of other governance models used by other projects. Uh, basically, just so all of us had an idea of how other people did it. Um, we didn't necessarily want to copy other people because we realized the project's a little unique in terms of having had a BDFL for 28 years, and Python size is also fairly unique in the open source world. And so we basically did this to educate ourselves, but no one necessarily expected us to copy verbatim someone else's model. So first challenge we had, how to choose what we were going to do. Um, and the problem is, is you, when you have no real mechanism in place to do this, it, it, you can very much recursively think about, all right, well, how do you choose how you're going to choose? Well, how are you going to choose how you're going to choose how you're going to choose? And so on and so forth, right? So it's a real pickle. So we've done the best we can, knowing full well there was no rules in place on how to choose. So basically what we've come down to, as I said, at least as of Thursday, is uh, we're going to vote. Uh, all core developers are going to be allowed to vote. Um, we are going to strongly discourage inactive core developers from voting, though, because basically, the if you're not participating on a regular basis, you're not really going to be directly impacted by the choice, as much as those are contributing. So we're trying to make sure those who are actually be directly impacted by the decision of the governance model are the ones that are actually driving the decision. Uh, we're going to use what's called the Condorcet method for voting. Uh, if you don't know what that is, basically, what happens is you get a ranked ballot, and you rank from one to n your choices from one being best to n being the worst, in your opinion. And then basically what happens is, is there's a pairwise runoff between every option. So like, let's say you had options A, B, C, and D. You'd have a runoff between A and B to see which one, whether A or B is typically ranked higher than the other. Same with A to C, A to D, B to C, and then B to D, and then C to D. And whichever one of those options won the most number of runoffs wins. So it's very consensus-based. So you won't necessarily end up with the one that's the most specifically popular in a way, but it will be the one that people agree upon the most widely as being the best option available. Um, there is a further discussion option, partially for political reasons, so that people can realize that we really do not want to talk about this anymore, because uh, we all assume that's going to be the last option everyone chooses. Um, in case of a tie, or actually there can be a cycle using the Condorcet method, uh, the easiest way to think about this is if you were to play rock, paper, scissors with three people and everyone chose one, there is no clear winner because everyone beat someone else. Uh, we're basically going to hold a vote within a week uh, with those people involved in the tie or the cycle. And we're going to keep repeating this until we freaking make a decision. Um, and then we're also going to be releasing the ballots anonymously afterwards so everyone can see how the vote came down. But that's basically how we're planning to choose. Uh, the current schedule, as I said, as of Thursday, is to start voting November 16th, so a week from yesterday. 
and have the, ballots, the voting open for two weeks. And so potentially by December 1st, we might know which model we're going to be going with. Now, what are the models? So first one, um, the technical leader governance model, PEP 8010 by Barry Warsaw. Um, it elects what he calls the gracious umpire influencing decisions officer, or the Guido. <laughs> um, that person would serve for four and a half years. Um, rounded to the nearest release so that no one changes in the middle of one. Uh, so currently that's three releases because we have an 18th month release cycle. Uh, there are no term limits, so you can be reelected. Uh, it must be a core dev. And uh, basically this is just the BDFL with uh, the interesting bit of being elected, having a term. And then there's a council of Pythonistas or the cop who uh, is made up of three people who can actually uh, cause the, uh, the Guido to be kicked out. It's basically a back, backstop to make sure that if someone got elected, they don't do something horrible. Um, so pretty straightforward. So basically, like it is now, or was, sorry. Still getting used to this was bit. Um, so basically, basically, this is just core, elected core develop, uh, dictator. Uh, PEP 8011. Uh, the Python governance model lead by a trio of Pythonistas. Uh, this is by Marietta and Barry. Uh, basically, is what the BDFL did, except divided amongst three people. Um, you have to be a core developer or a PCF, PSF voting member. Uh, both, sorry. Um, and the way this is gonna, the election is going to happen is everyone's going to be elected as a slate. So if you want to run, you have to run with two other people. Uh, this is to make sure the people who get elected can work well together versus just saying the top three people who might totally clash on vision. Um, no term limits, uh, it's for five years. Basically, I was chosen because that's the length of time you're a release manager, so it seemed like a reasonable amount of time. And then the trio can appoint uh, working groups to help make decisions and then potentially have those working groups be PEP delegates to make decisions. And those working groups last as long as the trio lasts. Uh, PEP 812 uh, brings the community governance model. So. This is modeled mostly after the way Rust runs things. Um, this formalizes uh, what we call experts. So if you go to the dev guide at devguide.python.org for uh, Python's development, uh, you'll notice that there's an experts index. And in there, what you can do is you can list yourself as an expert at um, certain things. So like, for instance, I'm on the list for import and import lib. And what that basically means is whenever something comes up involving import, I get nosied on it, and I get asked, what's my opinion? Uh, this basically takes that and formalizes it, basically stating, uh, if you write your name on something first, you get to be the expert. And after that, uh, you can add more people. But as the experts grow in a certain area, you need to all agree unanimously that those, that person gets to become an expert. Because basically, the PEP process will change such that the experts are the ones that accept the PEPs. Um, Experts can be disbanded by no confidence vote amongst core devs. And if that does happen, the new group has to be voted in to start. Um, if you notice, this very much distributes decision making. Uh, there's no head person, per se. So someone could decide to create an experts group of uh, language design and handle those kinds of cases. And then they would handle those. But there is no single vi person in charge of vision with this view. Uh, the other one interesting thing this uh, PEP does introduce that a couple others do is um, basically yeah, as a concept of a c dormant core developer or inactive or emeritus, depending on the PEP, uh, where basically if you haven't contributed in the past two releases, uh, you're considered dormant and you don't vote anymore, uh, but it's, you just need to get active again, you can start voting again. Because um, one thing you can do is with this model is you can actually vote against the expert's opinion. So they might say, we want to accept it. And the whole everyone else might go with, no, you're crazy. And then they can hold a vote and stop it. But if the experts say no, there's no way to do the inverse. If that makes sense. Uh, PEP 8013. So this is the external council governance model. Uh, this is by Steve Dower. Uh, so this one's interesting in terms of it creates a council of auditors 
who are not core developers. So this is very unique amongst all the PEPs in such that it specifically asks for people who are not core developers to be in charge. And it's actually kind of purposely fuzzy in terms of the details of what the cancel or how the cancel handles itself. Basically what will happen is, is the cancel is a minimum of two to a maximum of four people. And the way it's going to work, if this were to happen, is they're the only ones that can choose to accept a pep. But it's completely up to them on how they choose to judge that. So the thinking is, um, imagine you're making a presentation to your VP. Right? You're going to go in, you're going to plead your case, saying, hey, I think we should do this. You're going to go in, have your numbers, have your explanations, all that stuff. And then the question is going to be, from your VP more, more likely, uh, either yes, that's great, go ahead and do it, or yeah, no, I, I don't like this, or you're missing details of this, or have you talked to these people, go back and take care of it. And the thinking behind having these not be core devs is it gives a neutral third party uh, a way to come in and make sure that no one is basically misrepresenting or not doing their due diligence and making sure that it makes sense that what's being proposed by a PEP is thoroughly thought out, well executed, and actually will make sense for the language. Um, the, this uh, Council of Auditors lasts for a release, um, but as I said, the really interesting thing here is uh, their external. Uh, they can uh, be kicked out by no confidence from the core devs. Um, but that's pretty much it. Okay. Uh, it's so another vague one on purpose, uh, PEP 8014, the Commons Governance Model by Jack Nansen, <coughs> introduces a Council of Elders. Uh, all PEPs are voted on, and the Council of Elders, Elders decides if that vote represents that that PEP should be accepted. And that's basically as detailed as it gets. Um, Jack actually has said that he would consider this a PEP for anarchy, but there's too many negative connotations around the word anarchy, so he doesn't use that term in the title. But that's basically what this is. It's basically council that has, all right, we're going to vote on this. There's no real definition of how the vote would be handled. And the council just goes like, okay, based on what we're seeing in the vote results, we're going to accept the PEP or not. Now, uh, as I say here, um, Accepting a poach should be, quote, endorsed by or at least is acceptable to a sufficient majority of the Python community, end quote. All right. How do you decide that? Well, the PEP says, quote, the council is expected to use common sense and knowledge of Python in the community to judge whether the measurable outcome of a vote based on how many people voted, who they are, how they, how they did the vote, or reflects the will of the community. So once again, this is not based on, like, majority num uh, votes say this or that. It's totally based on how the elders choose to um, look at those results and make a decision. Um, and just because this is Python, so Monty Python has to have a tie-in, uh, Jack also said this is basically uh, stating that, quote, the supreme executive power derives from a mandate of the masses, not from some farcical aquatic ceremony. Uh, if you know Monty Python on the Holy Grail, you'll know that quote. Uh, PEP 815. Uh, so this is Organization of the Python Community by Victor Stinner. Uh, this introduces a steering committee, which keeps the vision and consistency of Python. So this one's a little interesting in terms of there's a very explicit appointed group who try to um, direct the language, but they don't directly choose PEPs. So uh, they're elected for three years uh, in a staggered fashion. Uh, but what's interesting is there is a camp of only two terms. So uh, if you're familiar with the uh, U.S. governance system, it's the same limits as the president, only two terms over your lifetime. Um, there is another restriction that members cannot work for the same company. Uh, and this basically is if your CEO is the same. Not even, so even subsidiaries count as the same company. Uh, the way PEPs would be decided is um, the committee can either decide to delegate or hold a vote, but the committee itself does not decide the fate of a PEP. Uh, so while they control the vision, they don't, just they don't control the decisions. So it's almost like um, 
basically they're going to write a, vi uh, a vision doc or something and say, this is the way we think the language should go, and hopefully all of you will give us peps that will go that way. Um, and specifically, to control th for this, uh, the community cannot be PEP delegates to help decide how their own PEPs are handled. So there's a very distinct separation. Uh, PEP 8016, the steering council model. Uh, this is the latest one. Uh, and this is from uh, Nathaniel Smith of NumPy and Donald Stuffed of PyPI. And this in institutes a steering council to, quote, establish uh, standard processes. So the interesting thing about this one is it really doesn't decide how PEPs are going to be chosen. It's deciding how to decide. So kind of like we had the problem with the voting, basically what this PEP was established for, and it's apparently based on how Django handles things, is it basically is specifying that we don't know enough right now on how we want to run ourselves to make that decision, so why don't we elect a small uh, group of people, uh, five, I believe is the specification of the PEP, of core developers, who will decide the processes we will use to make our decisions going forward. So I know it kind of sounds like it's kicking the uh, decision down the, kicking the can down the road, which it kind of is, but it's also kind of trying to put it under control, because as of right now, as I said earlier, we're totally doing this by sheer will on how to decide things. Like there is, it's barely, purely based on co uh, consensus and just people going like, none of people are th throwing a fit, so that seems to be okay. This is very much saying like, no, we're gonna specifically choose five people who are gonna make these decisions for us so that we can make sure we keep doing this and keep moving it forward and doing it in a timely fashion. Um, so uh, they have, so this steering council though has very broad power. So they have the uh, ability to uh, do anything, but uh, as the PEP says, they try to use this power as early as possible. So they actually can choose PEPs and make decisions on the process, but the expectation is they won't do that. They'll instead try to set up the process to handle it, and then that will be actually how things happen going forward. Uh, any core developer can call a vote of no confidence on the steering council. Um, this PEP also specifies how core developers will be chosen based on a two-thirds positive vote. Um, although the steering council can say, we disagree, that person should or should not be a core dev. Um, it also defines, once again, like some of the other PEPs, what an emeritus uh, core dev means in order for uh, making decisions in voting. And that's basically it. Yeah, that's all the PEPs, and that's currently where we stand. So just to recap, uh, in case you didn't know, Guido retired on July 12, 2018, as benevolent dictator. Uh, a lot of people were hoping he was joking. He was not. Uh, a lot of people were hoping that since he said vacation, he might still come back. He has not. Uh, Guido seems to like his vacation, so I think he's going to stick with it. Um, we are planning to start voting using the Condorcet method on November 16th, as I said, unless something's changed in the last 48 hours, uh, and we'll have a vote for two weeks, and hopefully either we will have a result or at least a narrowed down number of options out of the uh, seven peps I just talked about. Uh, which all range from another dictator with term limits, uh, with terms and a uh, committee to kick them out, all the way to basically anarchy. Um, if you were to ask me today, which one do I think will win? I would say, I honestly don't know. Uh, everyone's talked about holding like an informal poll, like which peps do you like? Uh, but no one's honestly had the guts to be the one who says like, I'm going to do that and have the first votes and then see how they vote. Um, so I really have no clue how this is going to go. Uh, but it will be solved. It will be settled. Uh, my feeling is whichever one gets chosen, if there's any vote, we'll be doing that probably in January. But my suspicion is that this will happen, be completely settled, hopefully no later than February, f uh, by February, and at worst by March. But that's, re I think, kind of pushing it a little bit. So... Basically, keep calm, carry on, keep coding, and this will all get resolved at some point. Uh, we're doing the best we can. As, as you notice, it's kind of wishy-washy about how we could handle this, but we're doing the best we can, and hopefully it'll turn out well for everybody. So that's it. Uh, I'm happy to take questions, but following the PyCast Gaze model, uh, which, by the way, has tickets available, and I highly recommend going as well to that conference, 
Uh, I'm going to take questions up front, so feel free to come up, and I will happily answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, following the request, if uh, you can come here and talk into the microphone so everybody can hear questions, and don't be shy. Uh, I have two short questions and then a real one. The, f the shortest, the first short one is, how many core developers are there? Just to clarify. Let me put this back on. Uh, so yeah, to clarify, there are 90, currently 95 core developers who are qualified to vote. There could be more. Basically, we're basing on the number of people who have commit rights on GitHub. And as of right now, there are 95. There are technically more core developers who could if they came forward and asked for them, but they have not. Okay, uh, second clarification is the a non-confidence uh, vote, that's majority, right? It really depends on the PEP. Okay. Some uh, are I mean, majority, in, some in are two proposals. thirds, it varies PEP to PEP. Okay, uh, and then the third one, none of these seem to have any PSF control. Nope, on purpose. Any, on purpose. If yep. you want to comment on that, that'd be nice, but not. Uh, really. Sure, uh, basically the, the PSF is always, uh, operated very much arm's length from the core development team. I mean, the core development team predates the PSF. Um, basically, the PSF funds whatever the core development team needs, such as infrastructure, paying for flights for people to go to the dev sprints, but otherwise they've always acted as a very much an independent group of people. So the board very explicitly does not get involved in core development. It's very much a political decision and so it's very much on purpose. Now, as you noticed, some of them said, um, like PEF 8011, the TRIO one specifically says, we want people who will be voting members of the PSF, maybe to make sure that the people who are in charge are also involved enough in the community to see what the community feels is needed. But that's basically where it stops. So it's very much on purpose that there's a very clean, clear separation. Hi, uh, I just had a couple questions about, um, oh, I'm in front of thing, about uh, PEP uh, 8014 in particular, or the Commons Governance one. Governance one. Um, firstly, uh, Jack. who, yeah. Um, yes, the anarchy one, yes. Yeah, yeah the anarchy one. Um, exactly who, who is doing the voting on PEPs, and how is the council selected? Uh, don't know. <laughs> Great answers, thanks. As I said, it's very much anarchy. The, Jack has the second draft. He said he's going to be coming up with uh, where I think he's going to specify how to choose a council. He originally thought it was a, an important detail, and I think he still kind of does, but he's going to clarify. But the vote literally is just whatever the council wants. It's very unspecified on purpose. Hi, Brad. Thanks Hi. for the talk. Um, I know the topic of the talk is about replacing Guido, so the question might be a bit outside of scope. Um, mm -hmm. During this process, I know we thought about, about how to decide PEP, but also, have you thought about how to avoid not losing Guido? As in, like, the discussion in 572, as you mentioned, is like a lot of negativity around it, and it caused someone to rage quit, mm -hmm. which, especially with Guido, nobody, like, that email is heartbreaking. And basically, have we thought about the process of, like, first of all, is that, like, do you think that discussion was healthy, or is there anything that we could change, and is there any process around in to make sure that that doesn't happen again if you don't think it's healthy? So, yeah, so you'll notice some of the PEPs very explicitly specify how PEPs should be chosen, partially in reaction to that. Others don't, but I don't think it's critical that the governance PEP choose that because we're all very aware that that negativity is the reason we lost Guido when we lost him. Now, he's always talked about retiring, and he plans to retire, like, I mean, Guido is, I mean, Guido has admitted that he's in his early 60s and it's just, he's going to retire someday. It's just life. Um, but it just happened sooner than we all expected because of this. Um, so some PEPs are trying to uh, deal with it directly. Others have said, like, let's get a governance model chosen and then based on that governance model, we will make changes as necessary. Multiple PEPs actually specifically say that the uh, conduct working group, which was formed in, I believe, August? in the PSF will be used as an arbiter, and um, I'm actually on that working group, and we're going to be working on, uh, re working on the code of conduct for the PSF uh, to make it more uh, stronger 
and more enforceable with enforcement guidelines and all that. And multiple PEPs will say like, we will take any core dev issue to them to act as a neutral third party, arbitrate, take care of it. Uh, some specifically say this is how we will remove commit rights for people. So it is being very much thought about and considered. It just varies from pet to pet whether or not they stay upfront right now or whether or not basically the assumption is, is one of the first things. And I will personally say one of the first things I will make sure it gets taken care of uh, once the conduct work group's done with their rework of how to handle things is getting uh, Python dev straightened out in terms of that. Final question. Hey. So we've had a pretty good 28 years under the BDFL model. Mm -hmm. Has there been anybody suggesting the possibility of just electing a new BDFL? Uh, yes. So basically, the discussions around the BDFL uh, came down to Guido is a fairly unique snowflake in the world. Uh, there are not a lot of people who have his depth of technical knowledge as well as his design chops. Like, I think everyone here will, who choose to use Python because they like it will admit that Guido seems to have a really good sense of design. And on top of that, he has some really good technical knowledge to drive other things as well. So it's, it would be very hard to replace him. Now, obviously, Guido wasn't perfect. Uh, looking at some modules in the entire library, you, you'll understand that he was never, it was not always perfect. Uh, but, I mean, he learned over 28 years. So some people said, like, well, if we elected someone, they might be a little rough around the edges to start, but they'd eventually catch up. Uh, and people basically ended up going, like, yeah, but that's a really, that's a really big gamble. And so that's when Barry said, like, okay, well, how about we have one that gets elected? Chances are, if they work out, they'll just keep being reelected. We'll have a backup mechanism if they really screw up and make a mistake. And that's the closest we came to basically a compromise in terms of keeping a potential BDFL model without full on jumping at feet first in with one specific person.